The next speaker is Maria Weber. And her talk is, is on simulations of flux emergence. Yep. Whoa, okay, sorry about that. Um, is that on? There. Okay. <laughs> okay, hi, my name is Maria Weber. Um, I'm an NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Chicago and Adler Planetarium. And I'm very interested in studying how stars get their spots, which I do through performing flux emergence simulations in stellar interiors. So today I'm going to highlight some overarching themes with you that we've found across simulations in both solar-like stars and fully convective M-dwarfs. Namely that convection, rotation, and stellar structure or spectral type, the type of star we're talking about, are all important contributing factors to the general trend of magnetic flux emergence, at least that we see in our simulations in stars along the lower end of the main sequence. So star spots are windows into a star's deep-seated magnetic processes, encoding information about the generation of this magnetism and its rise to the surface. The quintessential example of these come from our own sun, but through various observational techniques, we now know that there's a wide variety of star spot behavior, not just among solar-like stars with tachyclines, clines, but also giant stars with very deep convection zones and the smallest stars, some of which are fully convective. And the tachocline, once thought to be necessary to sustain stellar dynamos, is this thin shearing interface between the outer convection zone and the radiative interior in solar-like stars. So in light of these current star spot landscapes, now is a good time, I think, to ask not just how, get their, how stars get their spots, but also what can the pattern of flux emergence on stellar surfaces tell us about the underlying dynamo mechanism? So often the flux tube model is invoked to describe the evolution of dynamo-generated magnetic fields assumed to be the progenitors of star spots. To capture flux emergence, we couple two independent simulations, one that describes the evolution of individual flux tubes through the thin flux tube approximation, and another that solves for fluid motions representative of rotating stellar convection. The thin flux tube approximation is a one-dimensional reduction of ideal MHD assuming the flux tube is thin enough that all values can be represented by their averages over the cross-section. So this is one of the equations that we solve, and the most relevant terms here are the Coriolis force, buoyancy, this is a magnetic tension force, and an, aer an aerodynamic drag. Uh, our flux tubes are not generated self-consistently, so we must prescribe them a number of initial conditions. Magnetic field strength, depth in the convection zone, latitude, and flux. The choices of these are motivated by observations theory and dynamo simulations. So we start with a simple toroidal geometry for our flux tubes. And for some of our solar simulations, we assume these tubes are built in the tachocline. And for a fully convective M-dwarf model I'll be talking about and another rapidly rotating sun, we assume that these flux tubes are built by dynamo action distributed in the bulk of the convection zone. A stellar structure model describes the background thermodynamic properties and the flux tube is coupled to a time-varying convective velocity field through its drag force. So we use the analastic spherical harmonic code, ASH, for the uh, convection model here. And I'm showing you here the solar case. Uh, here we have uh, the radial velocity field, which depicts giant cell convection, cool downflow lanes at the cell edges, warmer upflows in the center. And the differential rotation profile here is fairly conical, closely matching the solar profile. And so one of the advantages of using the thin flux tube approximation is that we can do a lot of simulations exploring a large parameter space with little computational resources. So integral to the flux emergence process are these fluid flows within which these flux tubes are embedded. So we find that both convection and magnetic buoyancy work in concert to promote flux emergence. 
Magnetic buoyancy arises because parts of the flux tube are less dense than its surroundings due to the presence of strong magnetism. So here we have the solar radiative interior in gray, the surrounding convection zone, and then the flux tube rising in the middle of a giant convective cell. Downflows pin parts of the flux tube into the convectively stable radiative interior, while upflows lift parts of the tubes toward the surface. Now, only recently have a few unique convective dynamo simulations been able to self-consistently capture some elements of magnetic flux emergence, where fibril buoyantly rising uh, loops of magnetism are created naturally and arise naturally from toroidal wreaths of magnetism. So we're currently working on exploring the detailed similarities and differences between such dynamo-generated loops and these thin flux tube models. But one similarity is that giant cell downflows naturally induce loops separated by about 15 to 20 degrees apart in longitude in both simulations, naturally forming windows within which these flux tubes prefer to emerge. And we can also extract some properties of the loop when they reach the near surface and compare those to sunspot observations. So one example is the tilting action of the flux tube's legs toward the equator, similar to the observed tilt of magnetically bipolar solar active regions. Uh, so in our simulations here, um, convection alone results in a statistically Gaussian distribution of the uh, tilt angles coming from our flux tube simulations. Uh, and as, yeah, so which I'm showing here through this histogram. Uh, and a similar tilt angle distribution is also found from these dynamo generated loops, these simulations here. And in both cases, these do agree quite well with what is actually observed for the tilt angle distribution on the sun. So while strong upflows can boost parts of the flux tube toward the surface, downflows can also suppress their rise. So here are two representative flux tubes in a fully convective M dwarf both with the same initial conditions, except one is initiated halfway into the star on top, and the other one at about 75% of the stellar radius. And in the bottom movie, we have red regions of strong upflows, blue regions of cooler downflows. So looking at this top image, we see that um, even though part of the flux tube reaches the upper boundary, the majority of the tube is confined to deeper regions. Uh, to quantify this behavior, we calculate a, what I call a suppression depth here represented by delta R. A negative value here indicates that the majority of the magnetism is confined to deeper regions compared to the same flux tube rising in a stratified interior without the effects of convection. So here we have the suppression depths for flux tubes of 30 and 80 kilogauss initial field strengths initiated at different heights in the convection zone and different latitudes. And these results show us that the rise of the magnetism is more strongly suppressed by convection when flux tubes are initiated in the deeper interior at lower latitudes and with weaker magnetic field strengths compared to stronger magnetic field strengths. Stellar rotation also modifies emergence properties through the Coriolis force, which is proportional to the rotation rate. So here are the trajectories in the radius latitude or meridional plane of five flux tubes initiated in the bulk of a quiescent convection zone in a sun-like star and then the same star rotating three times faster. Rapid rotation deflects the flux tubes poleward and also lengthens their rise toward the surface. And this is due to the relative increase of the Coriolis force compared to the buoyancy acting on the flux tube. And the Coriolis force is also proportional to the sign of latitude and its action on the rising flux tube is thought to be responsible for the increasing tilt of bipolar sunspot pairs toward the equator with increasing latitude of emergence. And so we refer to that as the Joy's Law trend. And that tilt angle trend as a function of emergence latitude is shown here for some of my solar flux tube simulations. And flux tubes rising in the convective interior of a sun rotating at five times the solar rate do show increased tilt angles and increased latitude of emergence compared to, uh, to the solar case and also compared to flux tubes that are initiated with um, much stronger magnetic field strengths. And the type of star and whether or not it has a tachocline region of magnetic generation can also impact flux emergence, at least in our simulations. 
So here we're looking at what I call emergence latitude probability functions. They're derived from the statistics of thousands of flux tube simulations, and a greater width indicates a greater probability of flux emergence at that latitude. So this is a, this, uh, we're looking at these emergence latitude probability functions here for a fully convective M dwarf, which has a differential rotation consistent with solid body rotation. And the tubes are initiated with different field strengths at 50 and 75% of the stellar radius. So overlaid on top of here are the emergence latitude distributions for flux tubes rising in the same star, but with a latitudinal angular velocity contrast closer to that of the sun. So we see uh, that it is quite difficult to get lower latitude flux emergence in these fully convective stars. But there are some exceptions. Uh, if the flux tube is initiated closer to the surface and uh, quite strong field strengths, or a much weaker but rising through regions of strong differential rotation, you can still achieve lower latitude flux emergence. And for comparison, here are the emergence latitude probabilities for our solar simulations. We see that there's no low latitude region void of flux emergence. And Furthermore, even though M dwarfs are so small, their increased density actually leads to rise durations as much as 10 times longer than for the solar case. And uh, finally, the assumption of whether or not flux tubes are built in the tachocline affects their initial thermodynamic properties in our, in our simulations and has significant implications for their subsequent evolution. So preliminary results that I've been working on here uh, show that flux tubes built into tachocline rise across the convection zone much slower, emerge at lower latitudes, and tend to have a somewhat larger magnetic field strength near the surface than those built without the consideration of a tachocline. So uh, I hope I've shared with you some information uh, about how convection rotation and the stellar structure, or the type of star that we're talking about here, are all important contributing factors to the flux emergence process. And all of this work is a step in the direction toward linking flux emergence, convection, and dynamo action in cool stars along the lower end of the main sequence. I'm Tom Black, Space Science Institute. Very nice talk. Uh, uh, the middle uh, plot you have there, that's for where you don't have a convective velocity field, correct? Uh, right. So what you're seeing here, I've done these simulations uh, without convection. So okay. if I did put convection in for what you're seeing here, the trajectories would be much messier than yes. what you're seeing. They're quite uh, smooth. Yeah. But then the green on the... On the right there, is, and with the convective velocity fields put in, is that correct? Uh, so which one, sorry? The one on the right, the green frame. Oh yes, the green, yes. So those, um, so where it says fully convective M dwarf solar, those are the emergence latitude probabilities, yes, with convection. Good. So convection art is included in both of those models that you're seeing there, that's right. Hi, uh, Klaus Strassmer, AAP Potsdam. Um, if you describe your thin flux tube around the star as a wave, uh, what would be the wave number? Oh, uh, <laughs> it depends on if there's convection or not. If there's, uh, if there's not convection, the wave number that you get, um, like, oh, oops, sorry. Uh, if I'm thinking about, for instance, a flux tube like this over here, uh, so the, the wave number that you get is highly dependent on magnetic field strength, flux, latitude, um, where you form these things within the uh, radiative interior. But uh, they can range anywhere from uh, no wave number at all, zero, to upwards of eight or 12 or so. Uh, when you have convection, the wave number gets larger because convection is modulating those 
relative usually to where you find giant cells in the convection simulation. So the, the answer is depending on the parameter space, I guess. Oh, sorry. Uh, Irina Kityashvili, NASA Ames Research uh, Center. Um, I'm a bit confused um, uh, about uh, what you have uh, difficulties uh, have flux emergence for and walls uh, on low latitudes. Can you comment on this? Sorry. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned in your talk, you mentioned what uh, you uh, preferentially getting flux emergence for M dwarf stars on high latitudes, not yeah. for low latitudes. Right. And uh, I, I'm a bit confusing just about this. Yeah, so um, you generally get high latitude star spots in these M dwarfs, of these simulations, even though they're rotating at the solar rate. Uh, it all has to do with the balance of forces acting on these flux tubes. Whenever you have a smaller star, uh, you have um, the, uh, the magnetic tension acting on the flux tube is actually increased because the magnetic tension is inversely proportional to the distance from the rotation axis. So you get this very large inward directed magnetic tension force that cancels out any buoyant motion that you might get if you were doing that same flux tube in a solar-like star. So then um, what you end up getting is a situation where the flux tubes tend to rise parallel to the rotation axis due to the balance of forces that you get in an M-dwarf, which is a little bit different than in a solar-type star. And I can tell you more about that later. Uh, we can talk more about that and how convection affects that. Yeah. 